craftsmen and traders of the town, torn between faithfulness to Christ and financial interest, to compromise with the immorality of pagan ceremonies. Sexual immorality is always considered extremely serious in the Bible. It is also referenced when talking about the parallel immorality of turning away from God to someone else. God often described Israel's sin of turning away from him as unfaithfulness or sexual immorality. The Lord would say, you have cheated on me with your false gods. Jezebel's alluring and damaging doctrine was similar to other heretical teachings referred to and condemned in the seven letters of Revelation. The letters to Ephesus and Pergamos mention the Nicolaitan sect, and the teaching of Balaam is also noted in the letter to Pergamos. Uh, I think that these three groups, the Nicolaitans, uh, the followers of Balaam and of Jezebel, sort of represent the same issue that we're talking about here, of compromise, accommodation, and uh, taking the uh, followers away from a, a uh, attachment, or the followers of, of the Lamb, directing them to be followers of the beast. <laughs> yeah, and I think that's the tension. It's very black and white in Revelation. There's no in-between. You know, you're gonna follow one or the other, and all through the book there, uh, the prophetic message that John is issuing is, is to turn away from uh, the false prophecy, the false lifestyle that's being offered. If he did that then, it is still true now. So it is up to us to see what is in our life. Around us, the Jezebels, false prophetesses, uh, who produce such bad fruit. We must be able to unmask it in order to say no. That we cannot follow. Church history is full of uh, heretics who have come and introduced false teaching, uh, starting with Paul as he deals with some of these uh, teachings in the pastoral letters. These ancient heresies are still persisting uh, in the church today and, and uh, being revived and reborn. And so uh, we must be aware of, uh, of the false teaching that uh, is out there. Yeah, the message of Theotira, I think, is a very relevant one, to, especially to Western societies today. So as we live in cultures that are increasingly secular, uh, even increasingly anti-Christian in character, immorality seems to be the common standard uh, that's uh, all around us. Is Nowadays, we come across more things in one day that have a sexual connotation than my grandfather did in 10 years of his life. How do we live in culture and be witnesses to those around us and distinguish ourselves? I mean, how we behave with our honesty, our truthfulness, our relationships with our spouses, our children. Uh, these are what distinguishes uh, us as followers of Jesus. I, I think this is the real test for us today uh, as believers uh, to live a life of holiness that uh, shows uh, our love for uh, Jesus Christ. So what about the false prophetess Jezebel? What does Christ say about her in Revelation? The text warns, I have given her time to repent of her immorality, but she is unwilling. So I will cast her on a bed of suffering and I will make those who commit adultery with her suffer intensely, unless they repent of her ways. And so we see a very strong message to her, unless she repents, uh, she's gonna be put on a bed of suffering uh, and leading possibly even to death. We are almost surprised to see that Jesus suggests that Jezebel repents. The way we perceive her, we easily imagine that she has passed the point of no return. But Jesus suggests she repent. Repentance is what God offers all men. The Bible tells us that God wants all men to be saved. He does not want the wicked to die. He wants him to repent and live. God gives the sinner time to repent. The problem is that very often the sinner completely misunderstands God's patience towards him. He thinks God is weak, 
that God is not doing anything good or evil, so he can just keep on sinning until God intervenes. The judgment of the wicked sets the righteous free, and this is exactly what happens in Revelation. Revelation is the climax of the story, the moment when God will repay people according to their works. Therefore, judgment will be terrible for evildoers, but the victory will be glorious for the righteous. What is interesting is that the Jezebel in Revelation is called to conversion. At the end of the book, there will effectively be one woman who is completely good and one who is completely evil, Babylon versus Jerusalem. But at this point in the book, in a way, the woman who represents the community and who represents the church that is to be converted is still in between. She's wrong, but she can convert. And that would save her. So in a way, Jezebel is us. It's the church. A few miles from Akazar towards Sardis is the extensive Lake Marmara. I stop here to mull over my investigations related to the letter to Thyatira. The Bible gives us portraits of Lydia and Jezebel, two women who were radically different. On the one hand, Jezebel, the false prophetess who is encouraging Christians to get involved in vice and sexual immorality. On the other, Lydia a model of faith and one of the first female leaders in the church in Europe who worked closely with the Apostle Paul. Apart from existing historically, these characters are used by the Bible as a picture of the church and to incite her to be faithful rather than impure. For Thyatira, the threat was not persecution or imperial worship. It came from within the church. It came from the appeal of skewed teaching and from Christians living in moral compromise. My journey now leads me to Sardis, the fifth of the Revelation churches. Here I am going to try and understand how the church was able to set itself back on track several times despite its frequent aberrations.